great. And now we seem to be streaming live on YouTube. So thank you, Molly, for that. You're very clever. So good evening, everybody. Uh, I just want to Firstly, you, I mean, the wonderful thing about Zoom is I don't actually have to say who I am because it actually says it on my screen, but I'm going to say, nevertheless, I am Steve Waters um, and uh, I oversee the MA in script writing at the University of East Anglia. And for tonight, this is the University of East Anglia. So welcome to the University of East Anglia, which like most institutions at the moment exists in a virtual rather than an actual sense. Um, but we're really grateful to the many, many people who are joining us tonight uh, who've given up their evenings and come out of their own time to uh, come and look at some new work, some uh, interesting new developments from our students. So I thought I'd just say two or three things about the nature of the evening, a couple of things about the nature of the work, and then hand over to some of the people who are actually going to run the evening. So the first thing to note is, uh, as is evident in the title, tonight's work uh, largely, well, all entirely originates from students who are currently studying on our MA in script writing, which is a year long course, unless you're a part time, in which case it's a, a two year long course. Um, and uh, this work, they, they do many, many things during their time at UEA, but, but half of what they do, and perhaps the most significant half of what they do is their dissertation project, uh, which is a full length script uh, for any of the dramatic media, and it could actually be uh, several episodes, for instance, two episodes of a TV drama, um, which they work on. They start thinking about it in October. They pitch it then. We discuss it. They write a little extract from it. We return to it in the spring. We've done a number of reading events, a little bit like this, just to keep seeing how the idea is developing. And now they're really embarked upon writing this piece, which they'll submit in the autumn. So um, what you're about to watch tonight, the first thing to be said about the extracts is they are extracts uh, from a work in progress. So none of these pieces are finished. I'd be very, very surprised actually if any of them uh, exist in full draft form. Um, they are in the very tender early stages of development. Uh, on the other hand, quite a lot of them have been thought about all year and if you like the idea has got stronger but the script is still um, possibly at step outline stage or, or very much first draft stage. So thank you for being part of that process, because obviously one of the reasons we want to do these events is it's a chance for those scripts to get a kind of try out in some form uh, in front of some sort of audience. By the way, if you fancy doing this, if you have a, a problem or B would just like to announce yourself uh, over and above your actual name on the screen, do drop into the chat and ask any questions there. We've got people watching the chat and making sure that if there's problems they're addressed, but it's also quite a nice place to capture some of our guests, uh, make sure that um, we knew that you came. Um, so usually what we do around this time is we actually have a sort of stage reading in a, a venue in the city of Norwich and actually we generally do it at the garage, which is a wonderful venue in Norwich, like so many now tragically uh, dark, I think, um, unless Adam Taylor, who's here with us tonight, can prove to me otherwise, but obviously pretty much all theatres are very much shut at the moment and that is uh, a really tricky situation that, that the industry is facing. Um, but in a way, thank God for this technology because it's enabled us this year to migrate online um, and possibly reach people that we wouldn't normally be able to reach. Um, and so that's actually an exciting opportunity for us. Uh, and I have to say that everybody involved tonight, the actors, the directors, the writers, uh, and my colleagues have really uh, kind of jumped at that opportunity at very short notice. So we're we're utterly delighted to be able to be visible to you in this form. So very briefly about the structure tonight, what you're going to see, as I say, are extracts, probably about 10 minutes each um, from four scripts. Uh, it would have been five, but for personal reasons, one of the writers has had to go later in the uh, sort of season of short presentations. Now, my hunch is that once we've done our introductions, uh, we will move fairly swiftly through those pieces. Um, and I reckon we'll be done about 8.20, something like that. We're not entirely sure when we'll come down. So obviously you're absolutely free to come and go as you need. We won't take any breaks once we've started, um, except to sort of set up the next reading. Um, in a minute, I'm going to introduce you to my colleague, Mike Bernadine, who's going to say a little bit about um, how these readings have come about and a little bit about the, uh, the, the company which has staged them. Um, you'll notice that we're on a Zoom account of an actual theatre company called Coast to Coast, which is set up 
by one of the directors that's working with us tonight, Molly Farley. Um, but also, as Mike will explain, all of the performers are former, um, I think generally, I think all former, with maybe one or two exceptions, there, there might be one or two present drama students at the University of East Anglia on undergraduate drama courses. And some of the directors are also graduates of that course too. So it's this amazing endeavor that has been convened um, during, and actually has really grown during the sort of pandemic um, to meet the need that we've had with, the, with these events. So I'm, I must say on a personal note, how grateful I am to them for their efforts. You should have also received um, from me and from Tim Lawrence Cave, the administrator of this process, a fabulous program uh, with pretty much everyone's details in there, or one or two missing details, but generally they're all in there. So you've got the writer's details, you've got a little bit about the scripts, you've got a little bit about the writer's biography, uh, and you've got uh, all of the actors' details um, and headshots and some, some material about the directors as well. So it's, a, it's an invaluable reference point, I think, for not just tonight, but the next three weeks. Um, and we hope that, of course, we'll have you for as many of these events as possible and recognise that um, not everybody will be able to come to every single one. Last thing to say is, of course, if you have to leave or you can't make next week, which is the same time, or the week after July the 7th, July the 14th, um, as Molly uh, and the team have indicated, this work will remain on YouTube as, on a dedicated channel. Uh, on site. So um, that will be a, an invaluable reference point if you can't make every single one of the readings. And the final thing to be said for me is that each of the pieces, uh, each of the, most of the writers have offered you their contacts, but if you have any questions about what we do, all the scripts you've seen tonight, or you want to get in contact with anybody, please feel free to drop me a line on my email address. I think most of you know, um, but it can be easily found. So I think probably that's a good point to hand over to Mike Bernadine. Mike, if you'd like to just uh, make yourself visible and tell us a little bit about how tonight's going to work in terms of the acting and the directing. And, and, and Hi, thanks very much, Steve. Um, um, hello to everybody, uh, both uh, all participants and observers and uh, attendants. Thanks very much for coming. Um, as Steve suggested, most of what happens tonight has been made possible because we were uh, engaged already in the formation of, a, of an ensemble, which is uh, the idea was a, of a UEA uh, alumnus ensemble. There's always, there are always lots of people who stay in Norwich because it's a fine city and people have the momentum of their training and their interests and their community with each other, um, which uh, keeps them in Norwich after they've graduated. And it always felt to me, having been at the UEA now for five years, uh, a bit of a loss to not capitalize on that residual energy. So we started the ensemble in October, 2019, having no idea, of course, what was awaiting us. And the whole notion of what an ensemble actually means uh, was uh, thoroughly tested, of course, as we came uh, the other side of Christmas and started to realize in February and early March um, that we may not be able to meet every week as we had managed to do up to that point. The ensemble, uh, sits at around 12 people each week. Sometimes it goes down, sometimes the numbers came up. We occasionally had visits from directors from outside the city and outside the UEA, and uh, occasionally visits from um, alumni who were visiting Norwich and came to drop in on the work as well. Um, what's been interesting about working during the pandemic is that the first of all, that the decision was to carry on working, which was terrific. Um, we had no idea at that time, of course, how long we'd be doing this. But we have actually met once every week uh, since the 17th, 15th of March or something like that, I think it was. Um, continuing to do the work that we wanted to do, which is to capitalise on the momentum, the community of the training that we do and have received at the UEA. And finding our own identity as an ensemble, what we're interested in, what our imperatives are, and I suppose um, as we start to imagine what life will be like once lockdown is uh, properly ending, um, what we might get up to as an ensemble in the physical realm again. Uh, all of the people, in fact, one of the great things about the great things about the pandemic from our point of view has been to be able to receive more regularly people who are not in knowledge. Of course, what that meant was that we were able to over Zoom to do our sessions and to continue practicing craft and do more writing and devising new work with people as far flung as Lincoln or London or Hawaii in a couple of cases. 
So um, I want to hand over now really to uh, Molly, who is uh, Molly Farley, who is here both as a member of the ensemble and as one of the artistic directors of Coast to Coast Theatre Company, who are doing all the technical hosting here as well. Uh, very grateful for her help in helping to glue this whole endeavor together. She's uh, collated, curated and directed the scenes that you will see tonight. And she has also been the point person for um, all of the other, all the other work that's gone into the two evenings that will follow tonight. Um, I'm going to turn my camera off. Thanks ever so much for coming. And I'll hand over to Molly. Thanks, Mike. Um, yeah, so as Mike said, I'm the Artistic Director of Coast to Coast uh, and also a member of the UEA Ensemble Lab. Uh, so I've got my fingers in all of the pies that are involved tonight. Um, I just want to make sure uh, on your end so that you get the best experience that you can get out of Zoom, um, that you have made sure that you've hidden non-video participants. That will just mean that uh, you don't see anyone that isn't in the scene. Um, you can do that by clicking the three dots above someone whose video is hidden and they'll come up with an option hide non-video participants. Um, that's the best way to view this evening. So yeah, as Steve said, tonight's going to be live streamed on YouTube and uh, we'll send the link out to you so you can access the recordings. And I think that's everything I need to say. Um, I, I would just, oh, sorry, Steve, you're right. Oh yeah, so just one little thing before we dive in, Molly, I thought it'd be just quite nice to just very briefly show the writers, let the writers of tonight just reveal themselves, guys, if you, if you wouldn't mind. So we've got four writers tonight. Firstly, Brendan Connolly, or as we know him, Fred, uh, whose piece Bad Detective kicks us off. Fred, do you want to say anything about it before we start off? We obviously got a little outline in the programme, but... OK, I'll say there are an awful lot of detective shows set in Oxford, um, thanks to Colin Dexter. Uh, and this is a very different one because the Oxford you see in those shows is very much about OX1. It's very much about the university. That's not my Oxford. That's not where I grew up. I grew up around the car factory. I grew up on the housing estates. So in a way, this is my answer to Colin Dexter. But it's also my answer to detective fiction in general. And what I would say is that the characters in this, you're only going to meet them for about 10 pages. They may be a little more complicated than you, you might you might see them here. But there are people who come from the Oxford I know and recognise. And I hope that um, uh, I hope that over the full full episode, people really will get a taste of my Oxford. Thanks so much Fred. Um, Finn, do you want to just come out of the darkness? Very appropriate as your piece is Pets like der Dunkelheit or uh, Heart of Darkness in German. Do you want to say a little bit about it, Finn? Um, yeah, sure. Uh, so this is Hertz der Dunkelheit. Um, it's my contribution to the Heart of Darkness but genre type thing. Um, I think there's a monologue at the start which pretty much explains what I'm going for so it's probably best to just let that speak for itself hopefully. Um, yeah, don't have much to say. That's absolutely fine. Thanks, Finn. And you've given some details about it in the programme as well. Uh, next after that, we're going to have Sam Savelli uh, and his piece. Uh, I think it's actually called Oliver the Bedroom Emperor, Emperor isn't it, Sam? Have we got the wrong title in the programme? Or? No, it's, it's just the Bedroom Emperor. Bedroom Emperor. <laughs> it's changed again. <laughs> um, yeah, so this is a, a film script called The Bedroom Emperor, which is um, just about an 11 year old boy called Oliver who declares that his bedroom is independent from the rest of the UK. And then he has to basically just cope with the consequences of this after he becomes an internet sensation and then um, accidentally leads a movement that he doesn't really understand. So this is just a, a fun, uh, lightly satirical family film. Thanks very much, Sam. And then finally, uh, it's a night of sort of slightly tricky titles. We've gone to Latin this time, Nunc Dimittis by Georgie or Georgiana Dalliston. Georgie, do you want to just say hi and tell us a little bit about your piece? Hi, um, I'm Georgie. Uh, my piece is Macdimitus, and um, it's a sort of a time uh, trip, time melding of two times in one place. So you could say it's across time and space, but it's only on one space. Um, and it's following Odette, who is a little girl who meets a young novice monk from the Tudor times in the present day, and they try and save history. So when Wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much, Georgie. I'm going to switch off now. Uh, Molly, very much in your hands. I'll just pop in at the end and say goodbye. Um, obviously, 
this is Zoom, so things might go wrong. Um, internet signals might, you know, let's damp. So please forgive us and understand us if that happens. Otherwise, enjoy and hopefully see you next Tuesday. Thanks a lot, Molly. Thanks, Steve. Uh, so I'll now hand over to the readers for Bad Detective. So our stage directions, uh, whenever you are ready. Exterior, cul-de-sac, morning. A regal cab taxi purrs waiting in a suburban cul-de-sac. Interior, Heidi's car, morning, continuous. Behind the wheel is Heidi, 29, one of that rare species, the female taxi driver. Heidi is laid back and a bit scruffy, but she glows with life. Stuck to the dashboard is Eddie, a fluffy orange gonk with googly eyes. Heidi and Eddie, Eddie are kindred spirits. The audiobook of Double Indemnity plays on the stereo. The narrator is gruff, but there's a barfly poetry to his delivery. Three days later, she called and left word I was to come at 3.30. She let me in herself. She didn't have on the blue pajamas this time. Leo, 36, approaches. He's dressed in a badly pressed supermarket uniform and carries a plastic carrier bag. He opens the rear passenger side door and climbs in. She had on a white thinner suit with a blouse that pulled tight. Heidi pauses the audiobook. She looks up and smiles at Leo in the rear view mirror. Sam again, uh, going to Cowley Centre. Yeah, thanks. You can leave that on if you want. It's all right, I'll, I'll save it for later. Heidi pulls away and they're off. What was it? Some sort of detective story? Double indemnity. It's not really my kind of thing. Heidi's genuinely surprised. What's not to like? Heidi pulls out of the housing estate and they're on their way. She looks up at Leo in the mirror and tries a smile. I've always loved her. Good mystery. What don't you like? It's all just a bit far-fetched. Sherlock Holmes cocks a snoot at someone for, what, a millisecond and comes out with their whole life story just because some scuffs on their boots and a stain on their sleeve. Maybe it's more realistic than you think. If you pay close attention to the right details, you'll be amazed at what you can work out. Heidi gestures through the window at a grubby Ford Focus. Take the car in front of us, for example. What about it? Its driver is a doctor. No, he's not. No? Uh, uh, but look, first off, they have an Oxford Hospital staff permit in their front window. And look at the, their tyres. Really clean, even though there's mud all over the bodywork. I know for a fact that there's a big puddle on the way into the Churchill Hospital right now, deep enough to rinse off your tyres. And look at the back window. It's covered in bird poop because they park under a tree all day. The doctor spaces at the Churchill happen to be the ones by the trees. So, voila, the driver of the car in front is a doctor. Is that a bit more believable now? Not really. That's actually my neighbour, Matty. You're right about him working at the Churchill, but Matty's a porter, not a doctor. And there's a tree next to his drive at home, so better luck next time. The car pulls up at Leo's destination. That'll be 5.50, thanks. I booked on the app, so I'm paying by credit card. Heidi looks more closely at her meter as Leo gets out. Oh, yeah, then uh, there you go. Thanks. Leo shuts the door and walks away. Thanks for the tip, mate. Heidi puts the car in gear and drives away. Exterior, Oxford, day, a little later. That sweet city with her dreaming spires. This is a detective drama after all. But hang on, this story is about the real Oxford. Smash cut to exterior ring road, day. Heidi drives past Oxford's car factory as workers pour out of its gates at the end of their shift. Further up the road, her Ford Mondeo passes a vintage Burgundy Mark II Jaguar in a lay-by, smoke billowing from under its bonnet. Interior, Heidi's car, day, continuous. In Heidi's passenger seat is Tina, 23, wearing a collared shirt and polyester business suit. From her updo hairstyle to her carefully applied eyelashes, she's made an effort. Heidi pulls into the lane for the next exit. What are you doing? Why are we turning off here? 
You're seriously going to argue with a professional about this? Ivy takes the exit and heads into the estate. It would have been much quicker to keep going round the ring road. Oh, I get it. You're going to the shops. Well, I thought I might. Do you want anything? You going to get Mum cigarettes? It's not like she'll give up smoking if I don't. I swear, Heidi, if you stop at these shops, I'm going to throw that frigging bonk out the window. You've got to stop messing with Eddie. He is a collector's item. Heidi drives on by right past the shops. You're doing the right thing. Yeah, looks like that on the surface, but we're not the mum police, Tina. Or, you know, it's actually really simple. Cigarettes give you cancer. And heart disease. Right, and heart disease. Mum doesn't need them, so don't buy them. If she wants cigarettes, she can go and get them herself. Exterior, Mum's house, day. Heidi's taxi pulls up outside Mum's. Tina gets out and then realises Heidi is still in the car, engine running. You're not coming in. Tell Mum I'll be back in a minute with her cigarettes. Heidi pulls away in a hurry. Exterior, Mr Arya's shop, day. A neighbourhood shop built opposite semi-detached houses. There's a newspaper A board by the door that reads Police Hunt Smuggling Ring. One of the shop's windows is boarded up and spray painted with graffiti. The other window is covered with Man with a Man and Room to Let postcards. There's a lay-by for customers where Heidi's taxi is parked. She hops out and makes her way towards the shop when the shop door opens. Out comes Sachi, 23, bright and warm and quietly at peace with the world. Hey. Sachi, how's it going? How's your dad? Speak for yourself. He's back on his throne. Samar told me the surgery went well, you know. It was pretty weird to see your big brother stuck behind the till. It was good for him, but Dad's back now, so Samar's back to his usual tricks. I'm supposed to be making dinner for the two of them tonight, so I should probably shoot. Heidi looks down at Sachi's bag and notes its contents. Kitchen roll, a bag of sugar and a two-pint bottle of milk. I might just invite myself over. Come another night. I've got a dress fitting round auntie's later, so I won't have time to make anything special. That sounds like a plan. I'll, I'll see you soon. Heidi heads inside. Interior. Mr Arya's shop. Day. Mr Arya's shop is overstuffed but excitingly varied. Its shelves are stacked with everything from Polish croissants to off-brand eggs and ballpoint pens. Mr Arya, 53, sits proudly on a stool behind the till. Hanging on the wall is a screen showing four different but indistinct CCTV camera angles. As Heidi comes in, she stops to talk with Mr Arya. There's nobody else in the shop, so he's happy to have an audience. Hey, boss man. Glad to be back. I was glad to be back. Then some kids came and put a brick in my window. I'm trying to run a business here, bloody nitwits. Don't they have anything better to do? Heidi takes a sour belt sweet from a container on the counter and starts taking bites. As they talk, she nonchalantly hands, takes a handful of coins from her pocket and passes 10p to Mr Aria. You hit the nail on the head right there. They just need a hobby. Come in and here after fags and booze is their bloody hobby. They need to get a job. At that age, Sachi had a paper round. There's only so many paper rounds going, boss man, and something tells me Sachi had the inside track. Ah, oh, that girl. She's so much trouble. But I want the best for her. What can I do? Heidi heads into the aisle, filled with cheap Swiss rolls and Euro biscuits. Uh, maybe you could get her a job driving taxis. Sure. She can start by getting a driving licence first. Heidi grabs a pack of off-brand Jaffa Cakes and then carries on. At the milk fridge, Heidi spots the CCTV camera hanging overhead. useful, the camera points at an empty shelf in the back corner. Heidi looks around for more cameras. There's one above the toilet rolls, another next to the coffee and tea, both pointing towards the same corner. Heidi walks over to investigate the empty shelf. But then, the front door of the shop opens with a chime. It's a Farage mask and green bomber jacket. Mr. Arya's first instinct is to laugh it off. Oh, bloody hell, not that knucklehead Farage again. Farage whips out a gun and points it at Mr. Arya's head. This cuts his mirthful demeanour in a flash. I'm here to kill you. The words prick Heidi's ears, so she turns to look, then spots the gunman. She immediately ducks behind a shelf. Heidi's heart is pounding. She takes a deep breath and manages to keep a hold of herself. She turns to look up at the convex mirror hanging in the corner of the shop and watches the unfolding hold up. What are you after? I'm not after anything, mate. Well, don't be so bloody stupid. 
coming in here like a farage. Of course you're after something. Tell me what you want or sod off. All right. Keep your shirt on. Keep my shirt on? What are you bloody talking about? Heidi grabs a jar of coffee from the shelf and feels its weight. Would this make a good weapon? Why don't you take the money? Yeah. Go on in. Why not? Mr. Aria pops open the till, ding, and grabs a fistful of notes. Stop it in a bag! That's all there is. Hardly worth bothering. The gunman puts the full stop on this sentence by pulling the trigger. The shot is deafening. The gunman flees as Mr. Aria falls behind the counter, his stool flipping over. Heidi's heart beats once, twice, and then she's up on her feet and racing towards the door in pursuit. As Heidi flies, she lifts her phone to her ear. Ambulance! I need an ambulance! Exterior, Mr. Aria's shop. Day. Heidi explodes onto the street. Mr. Aria's shop. Old Side Road in Risinghurst. Please, hurry! The passenger door of a black Audi A4 slams shut as the car rips out of the lay-by. It zooms away as Heidi, phone still pressed to her ear, hurtles to her taxi and urgently scrambles to get in. I can't stay with them. They're getting away. Interior, Heidi's car, morning, continuous. Heidi fights with the ignition. She watches the Audi turn right at the end of the road, but then she's off. Heidi floors the pedal and roars up the road, one hand on the wheel, the other holding her phone to her ear. Mr. R has been shot. She slams on her brakes, stopping hard at the T-junction. The Audi is gone. Send the police to. Is the ambulance on the way? Interior. Tina's bedroom, day. Tina is lying on her bed, scrolling on her phone. It's peaceful, lazy, until the door bursts open. What the heck? And it's Heidi. She reaches Tina's wardrobe in the blink of an eye and flings it open. I need to borrow something. I doubt we're the same size. Tina sits up and tosses her phone aside. Heidi looks back at her sister and then down at her own tummy. Close enough. I'll use a belt. And dresses. Or suitcases. What's wrong with your clothes, anyway? Somebody shot Mr Aria and I'm going to the police to see about it. I need to look the part. What the hell, Heidi? Is he okay? No, I don't think so. When I was getting Mum's cigarettes, some bloke in a Nigel Farage mask came in and shot him. That's terrible. I tried to chase the killer, but he had a getaway car. But I think I can crack it. Heidi holds a black police dress up to her neck to show Tina how it might look on her. Tina's not feeling Heidi's mood at all. What are you playing at? Crack what? Crack the case. I've got to make sure they don't get away with it. End. Fantastic. Thank you so much, readers. Um, we'll move swiftly on now to uh, Nunc Dimittis by Georgiana. So I will hand over to our uh, stage directions reader, reader whenever he's ready. Exterior. Village. 1531. Early morning. Small houses litter the countryside. Fields branch out in every direction. The houses cluster more heavily around a makeshift marketplace. The sun rises over the village. Villagers make their way towards the fields or marketplace. Exterior. Wheat fields. 1531. Day. Rotten wheat fields stretch out in either direction, surrounding the workers. A man kneels down and picks up a dead piece of wheat. He drops it in despair. Osric, 14, watches, his face grim. Interior, main space, peasant house, village, 1531, evening. Osric enters a cramped peasant dwelling. The room acts as the kitchen, dining, and workspaces. A door leads to a back room. His father sits polishing boots. His older brother whittles a piece of wood. His mother stands at a fireplace stirring a pot. Two of Osric's younger sisters stand either side of their mother. One of the girls, Faye, 10, turns to look at him as he enters. Her face transforms from mild interest into a beaming smile. Faye, exterior, street, village, 1531, day. Faye pulls Osric out of the house and tugs at him to sit down beside her in the dirt. She clings to his arm and looks at him expectantly. He rolls his eyes fondly, but leans forward and starts drawing a dragon in the dust with his fingers. 
Interior, bedroom, terraced house, London, 2008, day. Fingers trace the outline of a cartoon monk in a book. Odette, 10, sits on her bed, lost in the book. Horrible histories, the measly middle ages. Seb, 14, her brother bashes into the room and stands staring at her. Odette looks up slowly and glances around. She fixes her gaze on Seb. Yes? I want to play a game. Okay. So, get out, and that's mine. Seb motions at the book in Odette's hands. So, it's my room too. Seb folds his arms. Odette sighs, puts the book down and gets up. Seb slings himself down on a beanbag and turns the TV on. Odette glowers at him. She grabs the book back and runs from the room. Interior. Front room. Terraced house, 2008. Day. The front room is a reasonable size. Propped on the mantle of a fake fireplace is a framed picture of illuminated writing, which is faded with age. Two bookshelves flank the fireplace. Odette lays on the rug in the middle of the space and continues to trace the picture. Sunlight filters into the room and a glint from one of the shelves catches Odette's eye. She gets up and goes over to the shelf. A book, edged in gold, sits amongst the other plainer ones. Odette stands on her tiptoes and takes it down. It is a book of illuminated writing. She is enraptured by the beauty of it. She flicks through the book. Her father, Michael, and mother, Kate, Enter the room arguing. Kate holds leaflets in her hand detailing home removal companies. Odette looks up, her face poised over richly decorated pages. It's not ideal, but it's out of my control. We have a life here. I know that, but we don't have a choice. Apparently we never do. Michael! Oh. Odette, don't play with my things, please. I wasn't. Uh, just, just go to your room. No, but... Kate looks at Odette fiercely. Odette leaves quickly. Interior, stairway, terraced house, 2008, day. Odette and Seb sit on the stairs watching the parents pack things into removal boxes. Odette sits sullenly with dry tears on her face and Seb kicks the banisters. He storms up the stairs. Exterior, terraced house, London, 2008, day. A removal lorry sits outside the house and the removal people loaded with furniture and boxes. Kate and Michael stand giving orders. Odette stands at a window watching them. She traces their figures onto the glass pane in front of her. Exterior, street, village, 1531, day. Osric's mother and father stand watching as Osric picks up a stick and draws bigger pictures for Faye in the dirt. Faye claps her hands in delight as he draws a scene of a monster being slain by a knight. Faye cheers. Osric smiles and turns to look at Faye. Osric's father walks up behind him and clasps his shoulder. He looks at him sadly. Osric glances to his mother, who passes him a small sack of food. Faye looks upset. Please, do not go. I am sorry, Faye. I promised to make it up to you. You always say that. His mother opens her mouth to speak, but no words come. Tears fall from her eyes. Osric looks torn. His mother dabs the tears from her eyes. Osric stands. Faye clutches onto him. His father takes Faye's arms off Osric and raises a hand in farewell. Osric glances at Faye. He turns away and walks down the street. His mother crumples into his father, who puts his free hand round her shoulders. Exterior, road, 1531, day. Osric travels across country, alone. Exterior, road, 1531, day. Osric walks past a stone boulder with an arrow and 10 miles carved into and painted onto its surface. A faded carving of Peterborough Abbey sits above the text. Exterior, motorway, 2008, day. Odette sits in the car, her face pressed up against the glass. She watches as a brown road sign, signposting local landmarks, passes. Peterborough Cathedral is signified by the words cathedral and a church icon next to it. Interior, Georgian House, Infirmarer's Hall, 2008, day. Kate stands at the door to Infirmarer's Hall, running her fingers through her hair. I just can't believe why anyone would think piling it all up in one room would be a good idea. 
Odette looks past Kate into the hall where all their furniture is stacked up on top of each other to the ceiling. Seb and Michael come up behind the other two. I know, but there isn't much we can do here. It's a complete mess. How are we going to find anything? This place sucks. Too dark and gloomy. Michael frowns at Seb. It looks like I'll t- take a little planning to dismantle this. We just need to make the best of it. Perhaps we should explore the area first. Kate frowns at Michael, annoyed. They share a stressed gaze. She sighs and then nods. Exterior, Peterborough Cathedral, 2008, day. Odette runs ahead of her dad and brother. Seb drags his feet, kicking at anything and everything. Odette rounds the corner of the cathedral and in the distance is the Norman Arch, a simple but impressive building with a big gate. Odette stares as a figure seems to disappear into the building. Exterior, Porter's Hall, Norman Arch, Peterborough Abbey, 1531, day. Osric sits in a small room at a wooden table. The porter sits across from him, staring at him. Osric looks around. A door behind the porter opens and a robed monk, Brother John, enters the room. The porter turns and acknowledges the monk with a nod of his head. He turns back to Osric, who looks between the two. Brother John approaches Osric and takes his face in his hand. He turns Osric's face, inspecting him. Osric frowns indignantly. Come. Brother John leaves the porter's room. Osric jumps to his feet and, with one last glance at the porter, follows Brother John out of the room. Exterior, Peterborough Cathedral, 2008, day. Odette runs towards the arch into the open space of Dean's Court. A bird flies past her and she stops. She turns, following the flight of the bird, and looks up in awe. The western front of the cathedral looms above her. It is an architectural masterpiece, with elaborate carvings and engravings and statues standing proud of the facade. Odette stands, staring, her eyes wide. Exterior, Peterborough Abbey, 1531, day. Osric walks out of the shadows of the arch and stops in his tracks. The monumental western front of the abbey rises above him. Osric stands, staring, his eyes wide. Exterior, Peterborough Cathedral, 2008, day. Odette looks to Michael. He grins at her, his face full of wonder. Impressive, isn't it? End. Fantastic. Thank you so much, actors. Um, Great. We're going to move on now, uh, straight on to Pets Der Dunkelheim by Finn. Um, So whenever our narrator is ready, uh, we'll start. Blackout. Act one, scene one set may be visible. The actor playing Fritz enters and stands in a spotlight. If he wears a bald cap to play Fritz, he is carrying it here. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome. Uh, My name is Toby, and as well as the play's star, I am also its director. Yeah. So I just wanted to give you a quick info blast uh, so you can hopefully understand, uh, you know, what you're seeing, why we've done this. Um, So this was written around uh, early 1988 in East Berlin by one Franz Auerbach, uh, based on Comrades The Heart of Darkness, obviously, Uh, and Franz worked for the Stasi, yeah, but he was also an amateur actor and playwright too, presumably. We don't know why he wrote this, uh, whether it was commissioned uh, or a weird fantasy. um, Or what? Uh, And we don't know how real it is. I mean, he must have had some kind of agenda but uh, and we don't know what people thought of it if it was ever even performed Uh, we don't even know that much about France himself uh, beyond that he moved to Yugoslavia in 91 Um, and it was lost it was lost until after his death in 2003 uh, when his nephew Michael found it among his possessions alongside a poster that he apparently drew himself a wealth of leather fetish pornography uh, and some experimental hair loss treatment it's true and I'm not just king shaming, it'll, uh, anyway. And then Michael made a few edits of his own. Again, we don't know exactly what. And then one night, 
I happened to come across a translation on a forum and I fell in love with it. And so now we're here performing it for you fine flowers in 2020. <laughs> um, so some people might say that staging this is no different from staging, uh, you know, like a Joseph Goebbels original, because the Stasi get a, got a bad rap, you know, um, but it's an interesting sort of artifact. And I think we can trust you to uh, exercise critical thinking, right? I mean, you've all found your way here and you can think for yourselves. It's not my fault if it turns you into a Stalinist. <laughs> and that's not, who's to say he wasn't one of the nice ones, like in uh, the lives of others. You seen that? I mean, we, we all tweak, tweaked it a little bit, obviously, but we didn't want to, you know, sacrifice our, uh, sacrifice the uh, authenticity uh, for the sake of your, well, our own comfort. How I actually cast my ex, uh, Katie, as, as my girlfriend, uh, just because she fit the role. I mean, obviously it was a bit weird because they, the cast, they all knew we'd slept together. So, you know, um, uh, but, but we're good now, um, I think. Well, it, it's, it, it's complicated. Um, she, she's not, um, anyway, <laughs> um, that's art. So let's get on with it. Uh, all right, enjoy. <laughs> Fritz briefly considers clapping, then exits. Spotlight out. A Stasi administrative office. A few workers sat behind paper laden desks. Hanukkah portrait. Horst and Fritz in grey suits sit at desks, scribbling into mountains of paperwork as the pre recorded monologue plays. It's been through a lot since then, but nothing can kill that spirit. And despite everything, a paradise has once again grown. A Garden of Eden, an oasis of freedom and decadence sat defiantly in the middle of an arid desert. Or at least, that's what those of us on the outside were led to believe. By the murmurers, the dissidents, the men on the television broadcasting from their enclave in their off-beige suits. The things you'd see when you peeked over that wall. But what of those who dared to enter? What about me? Nobody would believe my story, even if I purged the details I didn't believe myself. They'd think it another lie, spread by another Stasi sycophant. Maybe they'd be right. After all, that's what I was. I was the best. Everyone said so. I sometimes wonder if the young, handsome man who made that journey would have done so if he could see what he would become. I don't think he'd have cared. Back then... I only wanted to escape. The two scribble for a while longer before Horst speaks. Hey Fritz. Yes? What do me and the political dissident have in common? Hmm? Mm. Football pong! Okay. You see, in my case it is because I have a big villi <laughs> and in theirs because they are hanged by the neck until dead. Mm. Horst, buddy. I've got to notarize these informant testimonies by lunch. Can we? Oh man, I'll trade you for these uh, fugitives. They're so boring. Look at this donut. Uh, Dirk Wolf, uh, 19, wanted for humorously suggesting the use of a trampoline to jump the wall. Yeah, right, asshole. How would you even jump that far? And why would you want to escape from a state that has trampolines? Hm? Horst. Herr Mura, mega bureaucrat in pristine suit, bursts in. Horst scrambles to stand and salute. Fritz grudgingly follows. Good morning, Herr Mura. Gentlemen, and how are my underlings today? Wonderful, sir. More than wonderful, and thank you for asking. As they say, sir, the future is bright in the ministerial... In the ministerial right. Quite so, quite so. Uh, sir, uh, with your permission, I formulated a joke earlier that I believe is attuned to your sense of humour. Hmm? Go ahead, Breitkopf. What do me and a political dissident uh, have as invigorating as I find this state-approved banter, might I request that I return to my work? Oh, Vetter, uh, always so reluctant to engage in socialist frivolities. Your work matters not, which is why I'm here today, as it happens. As of this morning, your career is, shall we say, on the whole. Excuse me? My enunciation is ranked among the highest in this subdivision, Vetter. You heard me perfectly well. Gentlemen, 
May I introduce Colonel Regina Schaffer of the HBA? There's a woman in state intelligence? Enter Frau Schaffer. Low cut grey gray jacket, high heels, military cap, black leather gloves, utility belt, holstering a flask, and a riding crop. Looks like a bad propaganda poster. Of course. Those freedom hating Western bigots would never suspect a thing. The three men salute. Yeah, for sure. I bet they'd have a, a, a homosexual or something instead. Am I right for oh, PU? <laughs> oh, I don't know, boy. Nothing wrong with a bit of man on man, as long as I'm here to keep the gears oiled. Oh, my. Sorry, am I being arrested? I'm afraid not, much as I'd like you chained up. Boys, as of this morning, you will look to me as your commanding officer. You have been transferred to international intelligence for an immediate mission to West Berlin. All very secret, threat of imprisonment, etc. Oh? Fritz tries to hide his smile. Horst tries to hide his fear. Schaffer addresses the other workers. You hear that? Ears closed. Good. Uh, Mom, I... Uh... You are aware of the HVA's mission to protect our borders from the Western threats of bourgeois inequality, brand overabundance, and, of course, nuclear Armageddon, so that we may remain an effective buffer for, for Russia. Drink? She offers her flask. Fritz shakes his head. Horst takes it with the ends of his fingers, making sure not to touch Schaffer. He drinks and fails to hide his disgust. You may also be aware of one of our biggest swinging weapons in this, the dispersal of our agents into the so-called Western democratic governments. She spits. Horst hands her the flask, careful not to touch her. She takes a swig and replaces it on her belt. Of course I am, ma'am. Those men are heroes. You shouldn't be a bride cop, it's top secret. Oh, no it isn't, sir. Everyone knows. Horst! How could they know? I suggest you follow the party line, Brad Cup. Oh, but it's so squiggly, sir. It's so hard to keep up. Sorry, can we... What were you just saying? About me going to the West? Thank you, sexy. One of these. Carl, one of our best agents is one Colonel Hans Kurtz. Kurtz has been doing stellar work for the Reichstag for years, gathering intel on capitalist naughtiness, undermining their society, the usual. Or at least he was. He's unofficially, of course, gone missing. He's not officially dead, but that's our official, unofficial story. The unofficial truth, however, is that he's defected, which officially is terrible on every level. He's staying quiet for now, but to avoid a regrettable international incident, you fun boys are going to go to the West, pose as defecting traitorous scum and rescue him. Unofficially, I presume. The committee is still discussing that. Uh, Ma'am, if I may ask, on the grounds of pure uh, patriotic fear and confusion, why us? We are but humble bureaus. Hmm, that almost sounds like the questioning of a superior bright cop. Yeah, Horst, shut up. That's okay. His curiosity is understandable. We've come to your lowly office because the powers that be decided to try a new approach. Don't worry about why. You'll have Mura to thank you for selecting you specifically. He was very insistent. Sir? Why would I not want you gone? Fritz, you're our best worker, despite your mysterious and sexy aura. And Horst, what you lack in intelligence, competence, and personality, you more and looks, you more than make up for with blind obedience and relentless enthusiasm. It's striking. Of course it's striking, sir. I'd strike my own mother for the party, were she not imprisoned in an undisclosed location. It's almost as if you were gunning for my job. Which is why it had to be you two. You're just so damn... <coughs> expendable. Isn't right, sir. Best workers, eh? Of course, if your work here is of such high quality that losing you would be problematic, I am willing to allow you to decline the mission and retransfer to your former office. This would be an easy process. You're still stood in it. Uh, no, no. If the higher-ups feel that sending me into West Berlin unsupervised is a good idea, well, who am I to suggest otherwise? Well said, Better. Yes, yes. Clearly, their assumptions are better than ours. Mm -hmm. 
Yes, of course, if Horst feels he is unsuitable, I will dutifully undertake the mission. So, like... Oh, no, 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 no need to worry about that, comrade. <laughs> if my new superiors at the HVA wish to send me to that um, capitalist hellscape, uh, then I will go. Yeah, but uh, come on. He's the worst liar in East Berlin, hardly suitable for espionage. Untrue. Well, well true, but... Um... Enough, Horst. Yes or no? Are you going? The geese um, and horse head turn for a moment. I, wait, the mission is... All right, uh, that's a yes. Fritz, you're in charge. Your wit is matched only by your brawn and his stupidity. An astute observation, Mum. Horse salutes Fritz. His German accent builds to a crescendo. Agent in command, Veta. You have my full support in ensuring this vagrant is captured and dealt with swiftly and accurately. <laughs> horse turns um, the accent down. Swiftly and brutally, sir. Euro's accent is less noticeable now, too. Good men. You might say, stay forever young with the Haupterwaltung auf Klarung. Because your faces get shot off and you cease to age upon death, you see? I joke. It's a shame you have to go like this. Nobody is dying, idiots. Don't share a needle and you'll be fine. You will need to report to the Dakadekaweg Freedom Tunnel at 7 a.m. tomorrow for briefing and intensive training, followed by deployment at 7.15 sharp. So soon? I'm so excited that the blood is leaving my head to get a head start. I suspect you'll want to go and say your goodbyes. I know that you, especially Fritz, have a particularly mousy piece of meat at home who's going to miss you dearly. No wonder, given your chiseled jaw and head that is clearly bald by choice and doesn't look anything like an egg. Boys, you are dismissed. Carl, a word. Everyone salutes. Exit Schaffer and Mura. Horst, do you understand what we've been given? Uh, not really, sir. <sighs> no. Just do what I say. Don't mess this up. As your inferior, I promise not to let you down, sir, but fear that I may do so nonetheless. I can only imagine the horrors we will find over there. <gasps> do you think they may have many uh, homosexuals? In West Berlin? I'd assume so, yes. I hope so. And so that I can persecute them, of course. Yeah. Sir. They stand and take in what they just heard as Fritz's speech begins. I couldn't believe my luck. After all these years of helping to prosecute the poor souls who sacrificed everything for a taste of freedom, the universe had handed me it on a silver platter. I guess God really was a capitalist. Horst re-enters, scoops up some of the paperwork from the desk and leaves. Lights down. The rest of the voiceover plays as the following scene is set up. Of course, I'd have to be wary of the dead weight. I couldn't blame him for his blind devotion. It was all we were ever taught. But, I thought, even someone like him could be persuaded to my way of thinking once he saw the life that awaited him over there. I was sure that I was finally about to say goodbye and good riddance to the East to all the misery associated with it, but to all the joy as well. Fritz and Claudia's bedroom, double bed, nightstand with switched on lamp, Hanukkah portrait. On the bed, Fritz is sat staring stoically forward, pillow on his lap, while Claudia weakly kisses his face and neck. She is uncomfortably naked and not especially into it. She breaks away pretty quickly. I'm going to miss you. Oh, you should work on your aim. Ask the border guards, they know a thing or two. <laughs> I'm serious. You're the one thing left keeping me sane, and just like that, you're gone forever. Fritz panics and starts pointing frantically at the lamp. Why would you? <laughs> of course I'm coming back. <sighs> Sorry. You'll be fine. Just don't go finding someone else, okay? Well, you know, I could come with you. Could you? Think about it. They'd find it suspicious if two men ran away together, especially one as buff as you with one as twinkish as Horst. They think that we hate that stuff. It'd be much more believable if you had a woman with you. Mm, maybe. Plus, you know, I know the West. I lived there until Uncle Max chose the wrong day for a trip to the zoo. And for all I know, my parents are still there. Fritz gestures to the lamp. Claudia addresses it. Not that I would want anything to do with those capitalist pigs! Well said, comrade. So, 
What do you think? Yeah, great. For the mission. We'd have to get Shaffer to allow it. She doesn't know you beyond your files. She might think you're just planning to defect. And not that such a heinous thought would ever occur to either of us. Well, she'd never met you either. It's different. I'm a Stasi man. You're a tire factory girl. You should hear the type of things her type say about tire factory girls. Well, I think I've proved my loyalty, don't you? Why would I ever run from a country that made me inform on my brother? Claudia is on the verge of tears. Fritz hugs her close and kisses her forehead. Hey, there, there. I'm sure doing such a good deed for your country brought you great patriotic pride. And if you hadn't, we'd never have met, would we? It'll be okay. Shaffa seems reasonable. I'm sure she'll at least consider it when we explain how vital it is to the mission. Claudia cheers back up and kisses his cheek. He leans his face in for another one. She pretends not to see. I'm getting a little jealous of this Shaffa. Her ass is flatter than the earth, babe. I'm all yours. To the lamp. Uh, not that that's a bad thing. <laughs> Claudia swings one leg over Fritz and mounts him. She starts tepidly kissing him. He starts necking her. Seconds later, the lamp turns off, plunging the stage into darkness. All right, lights off then. Forget to shave again. That wasn't me, idiot. It's like I'm in bed with a cactus. The lamp turns back on. A cloaked figure, Sabine Kurtz, is standing by it, looking down on Fritz and Claudia. Fritz sees Sabine and throws Claudia off him and onto the floor on the far side of the bed, a little bit too hard. He steps in front of Claudia, adopting a karate stance. Claudia stands back up, rubbing her head and glaring at him. What do you want? We're communists. We have nothing that doesn't already belong to you. And I know Sambo. Claudia angrily jabs Fritz. He winces but ignores it. Fear not. I wouldn't dream of attacking someone with triceps like yours. I've come about the mission. Fritz relaxes a little bit. You people. You said I could go, all right? There's such a thing as knocking. I'm not with those monsters in state security. Fritz freezes for a moment in shock, before once again frantically pointing to the lamp. Monsters? <laughs> what kind of tasteless dissident humour is that? Don't worry, I've made sure they aren't listening. Fritz stops pointing and squints at her, as if to say, who the hell are you? My name is Sabine Kurtz. I'm the wife of the man that you've been sent to kidnap. Oh, that's just... well, first of all, I think their word is rescue. They can use whatever words they want. It doesn't change the truth. Not a fan, then. They want to pluck my husband from the slice of freedom he's found for himself and stuff him in the white walls of a prison cell. He is a victim, not a criminal. Oh, you don't have to worry about that. We... Victim of what? The West, Herveta. Those neon lights and ungainly hairdos hide a sinister underbelly. What are you talking about? West Berlin is America, with football and techno. Everyone says so. Food, culture, arts, self-expression. They don't send your brother to prison for trying to see his parents? Yeah, all good stuff. Don't believe everything you see on TV, Herbetta. I know the man my husband used to be, and he would never have betrayed his country if he wasn't deeply troubled. The horrors he must have seen. Horrors? Fritz becomes entranced, staring into space. All I ask, while you still have your sanity, is that you make sure he's all right. I want to know he's at least happy, whatever state he's in, whoever he's become. I'll find your husband, Frau Kurtz. Well, all right, we'll see what we can do. I'm sorry to hear that you've lost the man you love. I know how hard that can be. They're actually nice. Thank you. I'll leave you to prepare. Tell no one you saw me. If they find me, they'll lock me up for his crimes. And be careful. Not everything is what it seems to be. They stand for an awkward moment as Sabine slowly reaches for the lamp. Eventually, she turns it off plunging the stage into darkness. Well, that's annoying. Claudia turns the lamp back on. Sabine is nowhere to be seen. Fritz is still stood vacantly. What was all that about? The horror. What? Fritz snaps out of his trance. Hmm? Oh, uh, fair play to Kurtz. Her arse is fantastic. Uh, Claudia thumps his chest. A little too hard to be playful. Fritz is surprised by this, but tries not to let it show. Shut up. <clears throat> I don't suppose you're still in the mood for... No! Exit Claudia. Fritz whispers after her. Katie? Katie? K 
KT. <clears throat> Uh, okay, uh, okay, sure thing, baby. Probably tired from the hot sex we had before the uh, t- ten minutes ago. So, uh... He stands for a moment, unsure what to do. Glances off stage and subtly shrugs. The love we made that night was sweet, tender, and beautiful. Fritz sits on the bed, hands between his thighs. Neither of us said it out loud, but it was like we both suspected it would be the last chance we'd ever get to truly experience each other's bodies. Fritz reaches out the lamp. Just before he touches it, he subtly flaps his hand up and down, gesturing off stage. Lights down. Set up for the following scene begins. Likewise, we never spoke about the woman who claimed to be Kurtz's bride, or the things she had said. Claudia was fortunate enough to be able to ignore it, but I couldn't help but wonder. What was this sinister underbelly she spoke of? These horrors. I tried to do what we Easterners spend our whole lives doing, force myself to not trust her. But in ways that I couldn't put my finger on, the dream come true seemed just a little more like a nightmare. Exactly what form that nightmare might take was yet to be seen. But I had a feeling that Colonel Hans Kurtz of the HVA might be a more significant figure than I had first appreciated. And that marks the end of uh, Finn's piece. Thank you so much, actors. Um, We're now going to move on to uh, Sam's piece, The Bedroom Emperor, um, whenever our um, narrator is ready, we'll kick off. Exterior, ancient Rome, day. A crowd of Roman soldiers and citizens have gathered in front of a grand temple building. The front of the building is made up of tall stone pillars, above which is a balcony adorned with stone cherubs and Roman gods. The balcony is empty. A leader, a king, an emperor. The crowd are excited and rowdy looking up at the balcony. Giving orders, addressing the people, being respected, being feared. A horn fanfare sounds. The crowd are alert. That's who I became. The crowd go wild cheering. None of those things sound like me. The crowd go wild, cheering, applauding, weeping with joy. That's who I became. Oliver, 11, emerges on the balcony. He wears imperial robes and an imperial wreath on his head. He comes to the edge of the balcony, calm, confident. He waves to the people below. That's the story I'm going to tell. The story of when I became emperor. The crowd are ecstatic. Oliver, Oliver, Oliver. The chanting of the crowd slowly fades into interior, classroom, day. Oliver? Oliver? Miss Cleft, 30s, sits on a chair staring straight at us. Behind her, bored classmates sit behind their desks. Oliver stands at the front of the class. Behind him, on the interactive whiteboard, there is a heavily decorated title slide. Roman Emperors by Oliver Welby. Oliver blinks. He stares back blankly at the class. Would you like to begin? Oliver is holding a set of cue cards. He looks down at them. They're in the wrong order. He shuffles them. Well, do you have anything for us? Interior, Oliver's bedroom, day, flashback. A bedroom cluttered with toys and books. On the wall, various bits of paper are stuck with drawings, diagrams and writings in Oliver's hand. A vivid imagination lives in this room. Isabel, 13, sits on Oliver's bed, holding up a tablet with the Roman Emperor's PowerPoint on screen. Oliver stands in the space in front of the bed, full of life. Today, I am going to talk about ancient Rome, one of the biggest, most important empires in history. Isabel gives an encouraging nod. Interior, classroom, continuous. Oliver slowly nods his head. Go on then. Interior, Oliver's bedroom, flashback, continuous. Oliver delivers the presentation with pizzazz. Nero, Caligua, 
These are examples of the powerful leaders who ruled over the empire. Interior, classroom continuous. Oliver mumbles into his notes. Um, the Romans. I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about Romans. Um, Have you prepared properly? Interior, Oliver's bedroom, flashback, continuous. Isabel moves the slides on as Oliver talks. Emperor Augustus was the first, then came Tiberius, who led the Roman army to expand the empire. Interior, classroom, continuous. Another nod from Oliver. One last chance then, go on. Um... He looks down at his notes, then up at the class. They all stare back at him mindlessly. Oliver shrinks back a little. So you haven't re prepared properly. Go and sit down, you're wasting everybody's time. Learn your presentation by next week. Oliver shuffles back to his seat. Exterior, street, day. Oliver is walking home from school side by side with Isabel. You didn't say anything. You knew that presentation off by heart. I know it off by heart by now. I just went blank. I saw them all looking at me. They were bored. <sighs> you were word perfect. Freeze frame. Wait, if you really want to understand this story, you'll need a proper introduction to Isabel. Exterior, street, school grounds, continuous, rewind. Isabel and Oliver regress backwards along the pavement in double time until they reach the school gate. Oliver stays at the gate while Isabel backs further into the playground out of sight. Play. The school doors are closed. Bam! They open with force and Isabel exits. She then speed walks across the playground with purpose. Isabel is my cousin. She's older than me by two and three quarter years, taller than me by six and a half inches, and cleverer than me by about a million books. Isabel reaches Oliver, who is waiting for her by the school gate. That was her doing the fast walk, because... When you get to my age, it's not socially acceptable to run across the playground anymore. You understand one day. Oliver looks enlightened by this gem of wisdom. But the best thing of all is the incredible games that we create. Interior, Oliver's bedroom, day. Isabel and Oliver run into the room together. The whole room twists and transforms into exterior, desert island, day. Isabel and Oliver stand on a sandy shore wearing Viking helmets and clutching axes. One time, we were a pair of lost Vikings who landed on a strange tropical island. Monstrous humanoid creatures run at them from all sides. It was full of cannibals. The scene transforms again. Interior, prehistoric cave, night. Isabel and Oliver stand with a group of Bronze Age people. Another time, we travel back to the Bronze Age. Isabel reaches for a light switch on the cave wall. The cave illuminates with fairy lights and the Bronze Age people jump up and down with delight. Introduced electricity to the prehistoric tribe. The scene transforms again. Interior, control room, day. Isabel and Oliver wear police uniforms, sat at the control panel of some sort of ship. Another time still, we were lead presenters of police camera action. Zoom out to reveal they are in a exterior. And we stumbled across an unexpected conspiracy involving illegal fishing. Submarine. The submarine is surrounded by water. Giant fishing nets are close by, filled with fish. Exterior. Street. Day. Isabel and Oliver walking back from school again. Do you think your mum will let me and dad stay for dinner? Depends if your dad's done anything to annoy her recently. Guess not then. Exterior. Welby House. Continuous. Isabel and Oliver approach a semi-detached suburban house and walk up the short driveway to the front door. And I guess you better meet these two as well. Interior, Welby kitchen, continuous. Uncle Dean leans against the kitchen counter. Laura is at the kitchen table with a laptop out. Isabel and Oliver walk in mid-conversation. Not saying I would actually homeschool her. I'm just saying don't rule these things out. But you literally couldn't. Isabel and Oliver virtually ignore this discussion and go straight for the biscuit tin. They help themselves. I have all the skills needed to get by in life. I don't see why I couldn't pass that on. There's more to education than you think there is. You have no idea. They continue bickering inaudibly. That's mum and that's Uncle Dean. Sister and brother. 
arch enemies. Do you just say these things to annoy me? No, I'm trying to broaden your mind. As if you could. Don't homeschool me, Dad. Ha! But you hate school. Isabel and Oliver head towards the door. Don't homeschool me, Dad. They break into a run and leave the room. Interior, Oliver's bedroom, continuous. They run into the bedroom and throw down their school bags. Isabel settles cross-legged on the end of Oliver's bed. Oliver sits on a hardback chair in front of a small desk. So, what's the plan today? What about Romans? You know a lot about them now. Romans? What about Romans? There's something I don't understand about Romans. Yeah? It's, how did they, like, how did they do it? Do what? Make an empire. Like, just go places and say, this is ours now. Ah, see, I think I know what you're getting at. How did they claim territory as their own? Um, yeah, it, it can't be that easy. Can't it? Why not? After all, you know that all borders are just made up, right? Huh? People get annoyed about these things. It's why they all want independence. Literally, whenever you watch the news, there's someone going on about independence. Hmm. Yeah. But what, what does that mean? They want to be themselves. They don't want to be told what to do by some random leader who probably lives far away and doesn't really understand them. They want to change the made-up borders. Oh. Can we have independence? What? Oliver stands and walks into the centre of the room. He looks around as if seeing it for the first time. What if we did it? Made up a border here in this room? I like that. Could we do it? When you're listening, borders are made up by people. We're people. Yeah. Isabel stretches out her arms and looks straight at Oliver. <laughs> we can declare this bedroom to be an independent kingdom and you could be its king. Interior, landing, day. Oliver waits next to his closed bedroom door, excited. At that moment, it still seemed to me that the only thing on the other side of that door was my bedroom. That is about to change. A fanfare starts to play from inside the room. Oliver takes a deep breath, turns and pushes open the door. Interior, Oliver's bedroom, continuous. Oliver enters, Isabel is standing on his bed. All rise for the king. Several rows of teddies, toys and figurines have been laid out on the floor. An audience, they don't rise. Oliver walks towards the bed slowly and importantly. Your throne. Oliver sits on the end of the bed. I now declare that this room has independence. I announce myself as its ruler, Emperor Oliver of the Bedroom Empire. What? What's wrong? It's a kingdom. You're a king. Emperor sounds cool. But you're king. King Oliver declares this to be a sovereign state, the independent kingdom of Oliver's room. And now it is time for his coronation. Isabel picks up Oliver's pillow, which has on it a cardboard crown with a few sequins stuck to it. She slowly takes the crown and lowers it onto Oliver's head. <laughs> Fantastic. And there ends um, the Bedroom Emperor and all of our um, scripts for tonight. So thank you so, so much to all of our readers our writers. It was fantastic and so much fun to do. Um, I hope you all enjoyed it as much as I did. And now I'll hand over to Steve. <laughs> Gosh, thank you, Molly. Well, I think we need to thank you most of all, actually. But I mean, what a brilliant uh, set of presentations. I'm so proud of you, actors, directors, and of course, writers. Um, so, and also just a couple of things to thank people for. Thank Molly for setting up tonight so brilliantly. Thank 
uh, Mike, obviously, for bringing the, the alumnus ensemble into this. Thank Tim Lawrence K for producing our beautiful program, and, and thank you, everybody, for your contribution. Now, I wonder if we can finish, as we have finished three minutes before I said we would, which is nothing short of astonishing, whether we can permit ourselves a moment where everybody makes themselves visible and we just unmute and we dare to give a round of applause. So should we just see if we can pull that off without too much chaos? <laughs> oh, certainly not. All right, okay, I'm gonna start it off because I was so uh, desperate to do that all evening. Uh, isn't that a, such a happy sound, a sound that we're hearing far too little of at the moment. Um, thank you all so much for coming and uh, see you this time next week, I hope. And uh, drop us any lines or comments. We would um, and thanks Good job, again. everybody. Thanks so much, Steve. Thanks, Molly. Cheers, Mike. Look forward to thanks, seeing guys. you next week. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. See you all.